let's see how this audio works today. Oops. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists of all time. Today we're going to be looking at the art of, drum roll, Claude Monet. And we've actually, I think this might be our third Monet painting we've done. Um, and this time we're probably tackling arguably his most famous uh, imagery, which is his Water Lily series. Uh, and this spe specific painting um, is roughly about two meters wide by two meters, t uh, well, a little bit shorter than two meters tall, but it's a, it's, you know, a larger painting, but not nearly as big as some of his largest Water Lily paintings, which literally stretch all the way around a larger two large rooms in Paris. But we'll, we'll talk all about that shortly here. I love this painting. This is gonna be a fun one to do. And we're gonna to try to do it from start to finish in about two hours. So let's, uh, let's sort of talk about the plan of attack here. So what we're gonna to do to get started is we're gonna get the image onto the canvas and then we're going to stain it with a little bit of color and then we're going to talk briefly about Claude Monet's biography because we've, we've talked about it extensively in the past. So really today's mostly gonna be just a painting episode. Um, but as you probably know, I, I find it very hard to <laughs> keep my comments brief. Um, so we'll, we'll probably get into a few things, but anyway, then we're gonna start painting in the background, then the foreground, then the background, finish the foreground, finish the painting. And then at the end, we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison. So if you're watching this episode live, you'll get to see me do work through the painting from start to finish without any edits, uh, with the, all of the mistakes that I make. And usually, even though I'm a professional artist, I make one or two, um, we'll, you'll see that happen. If you're watching the video long after it was recorded, you can always just jump right to the very end and there's timestamps. Uh, chapters in the the uh, description below maybe right before we move on let's just a uh, quick reminder like subscribe hit the notification bell tell your friends about it join the Facebook group and upload a photograph of the painting that you make today to the Facebook group next weekend I believe we're gonna be gathering together just to look and celebrate at all of the great artwork that you've been making and that's probably one of the most popular things that we do around here so I would love it if you join that group. And if you want to support the channel with a small donation, this microphone, new microphone, which I, I just bought, I've got, and this big weird thing that you'll see here, uh, are all from the, the donations that, that people like yourself have, have uh, donated over the past uh, few months. So that's what allows me to make the, these episodes better and better and better and to do more of them. So if you'd like to see more of them, there's, that's one way to support the channel. Okay, so let's get into the image transfer. So the first thing to get an image onto the canvas, you could certainly draw this out. This is not really one of the most complex images of all, but in the, the description below, you'll see that there's a link to a, uh, a Dropbox folder. And in this Dropbox folder, you're gonna see a lot of other folders. The first four here are for our introductory episodes, like literally starting from scratch, what paints to buy. And then the next uh, probably 20 or so folders, and there's gonna be lots more of them. You see I've added a bunch more here. This is for about a month from now, we're gonna be doing the entire group of seven, of which there's 10 members of the group of seven, because some left and some joined. But anyway, we'll get through all of that, including Emily Carr, Tom Thompson, Pablo Picasso, who, who was not a member of the group of seven, but Anyway, um, and then all the numbered episodes down below, these are all maybe they're slightly more complex episodes that vary from intermediate to maybe some more advanced. But really, I think I try to make all of these episodes 
uh, accessible for even a beginner painter. So even though you might not be able to do the, the greatest job, I think if you follow the instructions, you could do a pretty good job, right? So anyway, where are we? We are right here, zero, zero V. And then here you're gonna see there are four files. Two of them are, are identical, one's a JPEG and one's a PDF. Let's take a look at those files. So you'll see there's the original painting itself, and then there is an outline that I have done, and you can download this exact outline from the Dropbox, as well as there's a little cheat sheet that I've included here that might give you a little bit more specific information on kind of the ratios for some of the colors that we make. So I'll be sort of referring to this uh, occasionally throughout the episode. So let's uh, get this image onto the canvas. And to do that, after I've printed out the file, I am going to, let's say the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, tape it down. And I'm taping it to a blank um, canvas board. And I've also actually just incidentally, I've also gessoed this. And gesso is basically clear paint that has plaster dust in it. And that helps to fill in the texture, the weave of the canvas and make it a little bit smoother. Um, that's just something I really like. I, I would say probably a lot of professional painters, the majority of professional painters do this process, put a little bit of gesso on there to get it smoother, but, but not everyone does. And of course they come pre-gessoed, they makes them look white. Um, but I like to put a little bit extra on so that it gets just that little bit smoother. Now, I'm using some carbon paper here. You can use graphite paper. You can buy that at your local art supply store or even a fabric store. And uh, this is, uh, tomorrow is a big holiday, a new holiday here in Canada uh, for uh, reconciliation with the first people. And some people refer to it as orange shirt day. So I'm just, I got my little pin there. I could put it on my shirt, but it, you, you might see it a little bit more clearly on screen here. Um, so I'm just gonna trace this really quickly. Now we're gonna paint over all of this. And so I am not at all worried about doing a great job of this you know some of my lines are gonna be pretty wonky I just want something that helps me get into the the, the the basic ballpark here so that the composition and the composition is how is this composed is roughly accurate as I said I could just sketch this out and probably many of you will if you don't have a printer at home but uh, this this also kind of helps if you're a beginner painter um, just jump right past the drawing process because often I think when people are making paintings and they're unhappy with the paintings it's not really the that the painting itself is poorly done it's usually it's the drawing that uh, might be maybe a little bit less accurate than you'd hoped and when the drawing is off it's sort of like the foundations of your house being a little bit unsteady right and then if there's an earthquake it falls apart right so the stronger the foundation the more it's able to uh, support the painting that goes over top of it so you can see I'm just look how quickly and sloppily I've done all this and if anything it kind of will will suit this painting. Now, I could do the signature. I might save that until the very end, maybe? Well, let, let's just do it right now. <laughs> Debating it, I'm just gonna, let's just... Okay, it looks a little bit blurred. Okay, so you could see you know, it's yeah, a little bit, a uh, little bit hurried of lines, but I don't mind, and neither should you. I, I've when I teach these classes in person, there will be people who will spend 
literally 45 minutes doing the outline. And I'll be like, don't worry, it doesn't have to be perfect. And you're like, oh, no, it's okay. I, I know, I know. It's pretty sloppy. It, and I'm like, it's for 45 minutes, I think it's not sloppy at all. I think you've done a pretty good job. I do like to kind of keep these around just in case. Um, so, uh, let's, uh, I think we're ready to go on to the next step here. So, the next step as part of this process is to apply a little bit of paint across the entire surface of the painting. And we call that the imprematura, right? This is a, an Italian term that has been around for over 600 years. And, and really, most of the greatest painters of all time have been doing this. And I'd also say probably a lot of professional artists who who know what they're doing, also do this. Now, before I, I start putting paint on here, I wanna let you know what paint I'm going to be using, right? So this is the brand that I'm using, not sponsored, not paid by anybody, I don't get free materials, I go and buy it myself to do all of these episodes, or with the generous donations that you guys contribute. But uh, one of the, like, so when I, if you hear me saying I'm gonna use a cool yellow, well, that's the cool yellow. If you hear me talking about a warm blue, that this is the ultramarine blues, and etc. Right? Um, you know that I very rarely use black, but if you wanted to use black, they do make two different blacks, but one of the things to always remember is generally the paints that we're using usually come in the larger size tubes or jars regardless of the brand. So that's a good hint. If you're sitting there looking at two tubes, which is the right one? Often a brand will make larger jars for, you know, uh, that are, you know, just like you can get a small little thing of milk at the grocery store and a big jug of milk. Same sort of thing, right? It's cheaper when you get, when you buy more. But it's a good idea that the larger jars tend to follow this formula, which is what, this is what we refer to as a split primary palette. I'm not the first one to invent this, this method, um, but I do think it is probably, especially for beginners, the best, for sure, by a long shot. Uh, if you want to use Golden, this is much more expensive brand of paint, much, well, you know, it's probably four times the price for, for maybe 25% better quality. Which, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, become, if you want to move into a more professional sphere, that can be worth it, for sure. Windsor & Newton, um, Liquitex, Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supplies, Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, and Dyler Rowney. And there's a couple new ones I haven't added here for some of my friends down in India who've, uh, who I've been chatting with recently. So I'll add that for next week. Uh, remind me to do that. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to put some of this warm yellow onto my palette here. Just realized I didn't get my water. So let me get my water. Trying out this new audio setup. Let me know. Oops. It's just, I've, I've got two big, two microphones, a lapel and this one. Tell me how the audio is working. Do you like it? Does it sound better? Worse than normal? Quieter? Too loud? All of that would be helpful information. <laughs> is the, oh, the music might be a little loud. Let me take that down. I, I, I can't hear the music, even though one of my best friends of all time did the music. So I rely on, on those of you that are watching live to keep me um, on track here. So I've put some of my warm yellow on here, and I'm going to put a little bit of water, about uh, half and half. Actually, I'd probably put a little bit less water than I normally do, not out of 
p purpose at all. It just that's just what happened, and I, I always think you can roll with whatever happens when it comes to a painting. Uh, don't worry about um, fall. It's it doesn't have. It's painting is not. It's it's a little bit like cooking in that we can kind of follow a, a recipe to a certain extent, but at after a while. When, as you're painting, you start to, like, yeah, you know what, it's just, I'm gonna allow for a little bit of creative license. So this painting is gonna be a little bit more intensely yellow than, than maybe normal, but uh, the reason why I, I use, so the Imprimatura traditionally is a, a little bit more of a rusty red or a rusty brown color. Why am I not putting the rusty brown color? It's because other if I using this palette, I'd have to mix it, which takes a little bit longer to do. And at the start of one of these episodes, I just want to get started, get things going as quickly as possible. And I just really like the, the results of this warm yellow. And I know there's people who've been painting with me for years now who don't do this or don't use the warm yellow. And that's totally fine. No problem with that. And we've experimented with different colors and things over the years. Believe Jesus is the Lord says, sounds crisp and clear. Kathy says, the microphone is working good. Seems the same as before to me. Believe Jesus says, the music is a bit overpowering on your voice. Okay, good to know. I turned my microphone down, and the music stayed the same. Yeah, it's been, it's, I, I used to do these episodes like two, three, four times a week, and now I'm down to once a week after a bit of a break, and you'd be surprised how this, that muscle memory kind of goes a little bit. Thank you guys for, for uh, pointing that out. Okay, so hopefully that makes it a little bit better. Okay, so while this dries, let's take a look at... Let's take a look at the biography of Claude Monet and a little bit more specifically about the Water Lily series here. Because he did a lot of paintings in this Water Lily series. Well, maybe just another reminder, join the Facebook group, upload your picture to the Facebook group when we're all done today. Um, as I said, we've we've talked about Claude Monet's work and his biography kind of in depth. I probably went on for 45 minutes the last time we did this, just back in March. So you can watch that episode where we painted probably his second most famous series, which is The Haystacks. Um, so I'm not really going to dive too much in and repeat myself here. But, you know, it, I think it's just helpful to remember. So he's born 1840 and dies in 1926. I think it's interesting because when we think of the Impressionists, and the, the Claude Monet was a member of the Impressionist movement, um, or were they a, really a group? That's something I have to think about. I'm not sure if there was really a, an Impressionist group, but there was uh, a number of artists um, who were painting around the 1870s, 1880s, that became known as the Impressionists, and that movement was named after a painting by Claude Monet called Impression Sunrise and we did that painting a couple of years ago I think for New Year's I think I can remember what we um, but uh, I think a lot of people forget that Claude Monet lived all the way till age 86 and died in, in 1926 so that's you know at that point in in history Cubism is in full swing. It's Cubism is sort of taking over the world. That's what everyone's painting at that time. And really, in the 19, late 1910s, early 1920s, 
uh, Claude Monet is in the, the water lily phase. That's what he's he's been doing that maybe for a decade. And at that point in his life, he has cataracts and he's basically, he's legally blind. He can barely see. And yet he's making these gigantic paintings. So I'm just going to go right to the this water lily series and maybe even... I want to show you, oh, come on, did I not get the orangerie? Oh, yeah, so here, if you're ever in Paris and you're painting today's painting, you're watching me right now, you have got to make a stop and spend an hour or two inside the Musée d'Orangerie, which I I think is right across the Seine River from the Musée d'Orsay, which is another epically incredible museum that has a lot of impressionist paintings in it um, and but this museum which is in the park across the river uh, is is mostly dedicated to these gigantic murals or they're on canvas but by Monet of this water lily series and they're it's incredible the, the room itself is really cool because these big, big oval shapes and um, the way that it's lit like it's, you sort of feel like you're in a spaceship. And especially the way that these water lilies are painted in that we're sort of looking down into the water or kind of, so we don't really, they're, they're technically landscapes, but really, you know, if we look at a lot of these uh, kind of larger series, weren't there some up here? Or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's right here. So here's an example of one of those large paintings. Again, these are maybe 10, 12 feet tall by that's got to be what, 100 feet wide, like, I mean, huge paintings. So when you're standing, the idea is that when you're standing up to it, it you sort of just dissolve into it, like, you don't really see the edges unless you're looking down or up, you don't see your feet or the ceiling. And you just sort of feel like you're falling into this space absolutely incredible um but uh you know as we look at this page here you can see there's just i mean there's hundreds of these well i don't i don't know if there's hundreds but there's certainly getting up there number of these paintings here i mean look at all of them some of them are smaller obviously and some of them are much bigger some of them we do see these bridges which that bridge is um, in his backyard. So one of the things, Claude Monet became very successful in the 1870s, 1880s for his, his paintings, his impressionist paintings of landscapes, etc. And, and also of his family, painting his wife and his children, kind of with these umbrellas, parasols, standing in kind of fields of lavender and... and but after he made a, a, kind of a, a good living from those artworks, he, he was like, I, the whole time I could not wait to get outside of Paris. I was not a fan of the loud hustle and bustle. And so he moved him and his family to a small village. It's still a tiny village outside southeast. I think it's southeast or south or north of Paris. Paris, about like a 45 minute drive called Giverny. And Giverny is where he has this, it's now a museum, his house and garden. And you could still, you can walk around the garden, walk over the bridge just as he did. Actually in this painting, here's Monet in underneath the bridge painting away. So it's this beautiful landscape that is kind of inspired by Japanese prints that were sort of flooding Europe at that time. Um, you know, Japan was sort of opening up to the, the Western world, and one of the things that um, sort of the byproducts of this increased trade was the proliferation of prints by, by these great Japanese woodblock printers. Uh, Hiroshi uh, was the probably the, the most famous, and we also did a painting of Hiroshi's the, the Great Wave, a very, very famous image. But a lot of artists like Monet, like Vincent van Gogh, who was part of the post-Impressionist movement that began 
shortly thereafter. And in fact, some artists are kind of cross from Impressionism and into post-Impressionism. But uh, a lot of them collected images like this. Like, I believe this is actually one of... Um, this, well, I don't actually, maybe this isn't one of uh, Claude Monet's that he actually owned himself, but he, uh, the Japanese artists were, were very into landscape um, and a particular kind of like these bucolic lands, you know, like idealized landscapes of, you know, um, uh, that, that I think people in Europe who were in the middle of undergoing the Industrial Revolution uh, re were very attracted to. Because, you know, at this time in Paris and in London, you literally have people dying from uh, the, the cloudy skies full of, of coal dust and the pollution is outstanding. There's trains now and it's loud and busy. A massive transformation from the way life was maybe just 20, 30 years before. So these images of that it sort of purported to show like a whole different world where life was peaceful and, and, uh, and seemingly quiet and idealized were very attractive to those European artists. So Monet literally transformed his backyard into a quote-unquote traditional Japanese garden because I don't think he, he never had traveled to Japan all his idea of what a, a Japanese garden would have been, you know, probably filtered through a few a few different layers there. Um, what else do I want to talk about? I want to get right into the painting here shortly. So, uh, but this is the painting itself. And this painting is in the uh, collection of a museum in... Uh, um, is it Vienna? Where is this museum? The Pin Pinakothek, Den or Denmark? Sorry, maybe it's Denmark. <laughs> I had a. I realized I had a, a web page for the museum open, which I've since closed. But so my apologies. But it's um, anyway. There's a lot of great masterpieces in here. I was looking at their collection earlier. So. Uh, let's, I, yeah, you know what, let's just jump right into the painting itself, because I'd love to get this painting done, whoa, okay, so we're already half hour in, let's do this, so, the next step that one might want to consider doing is what's called an underpainting, and I've talked about this before, but an underpainting has different meanings for different artists. Some artists will will sort of combine the imprematura into the underpainting and sort of paint with maybe, um, a th you know, do a, a kind of coat of paint like we've done here, but maybe have uh, more concentrated pigment and literally draw the painting out, which is something we're gonna do next week when we look at another Impressionist painter, um, Berta Morisot, who was really the, the best female imp, uh, Impressionist painter. Um, and she will we'll sort of experiment with a little bit of, of that technique, kind of combining the underpainting and inputting mature together. But for today's purpose, we're, I even wonder if I want to do any underpainting at all. I think I'm just going to leave it. I think I... The, I, I, I'm going to be able to see my lines well enough. Underpainting, I find, is much more helpful if we're doing really complex imagery or faces and getting the eyes and nose in before we coat with too much. So, yeah, I'm going to skip the underpainting, and I'm going to go to directly into our background, and I'm just going to start painting um, the, the, the and mixing the colors for the background. So how about, before we do that, let's just get some actual paint on our painting. Let's move that out of the way temporarily. So again, if you're just jumped to this section of the video, um, I, I, and I've, I've talked about what colors these are already. 
I'm not sure if I, well, I don't know if we're going to use all of these colors. I sometimes notice that I use probably my cool red the least. So if you're um, placing bets on which paint I'm going to use more or less, it might be the cool red. But I'm not a gambling man, so um, you may not want to take odds from me. Okay. So believe Jesus is Lord asks, would the underpainting provide depth? Um. Well, I sup. Yes, I suppose it does. Yes, I. I mean. It depends on how you how you want to think about depth. In in terms of the way Monet paints, um, yes, because the the purpose of that aim Pune Matura is to give an extra little bit of of warmth. That's why I'm using warm yellow, uh, a little bit of like almost like a Kodachrome filter. Like people will use like filters on their Instagram photos, and it gives it kind of that warm summer afternoon kind of vibe that I really like. So let's, um, now that I've got all my paints on my palette here with the split primary palette, like two yellows, two reds, and two blues, right? Because we're splitting the primary color into two because really every color is either warm or cool. So the idea of just painting with one yellow or one red or one blue is... Um, is, is, uh, I think actually makes painting a little bit more difficult. I think I find it much harder to get the color that I want. So you kind of have to make all these concessions and, and I don't want to make concessions. Um, so, oh, well, I wanted to show this here, the, my little cheat sheet that I've created for you. So we've done the, the, the image transfer. We've done the input amateur. Now we're doing the background. And so what I've said here is 60% cool blue, 30% cool yellow, 10% white. We'll see how close I am to those, those numbers here. So when we, we look at that, basically what I'm talking about is, is this kind of teal color. And that teal color is mostly blue, but it's, ver it's a cool blue and it's verging towards green. So, what we, we've we got this, this is our cool blue, but if we just paint that cool blue, it's just going to be too blue. We want a little bit of cool yellow in it. So we want something that's just a little bit over here. That's why I was saying, you know, maybe 30% um, yellow, mostly blue, because the blue's going to overpower the yellow anyway. That's why... You know, if you just put 5% yellow in it, it's just barely going to change this. And then we're going to put some white into it to tint the color. When we add white to a color, we tint it. And so let's just see how close we can get. In fact, let's... It's going to zoom in maybe even more. Put that up there. Okay. Oh, here's the brush I want to use. Maybe let's zoom in as well. Okay. Um, where should I mix this? Let's do this up here. So I'm going to take some of my blue. And then I'm going to take some yellow. And I like to kind of just put it to the side here so that I don't mix it all at once. So you can see I'm mixing a little bit in there. And the color's transforming, becoming almost a little bit darker, one might argue. Um, and now it's a it's a teal, but it's now much, it's too dark. Like, let's see if I turn this here. We can see that that teal kind of works for some of these areas, 
but we we it's not nearly white enough to get into some of these other areas. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take some white, and again I'm going to mix it to the side. Maybe I'll just show you here. So that's pretty close. If I felt like I needed, like let's say I could take a little bit more yellow. If I'm mixing into here, we don't want to put too much in there. Otherwise it's going to go really green really quickly. I think that's good enough. So I'm just going to jump back to here. I'll move this just out of, or just at the top of my frame here. And then as I paint this, one of the things that I'm going to do and what Monet would do is you'll notice that I, one of the things that Monet would do is always, like almost every time he dips his brush back into the paint on his palette, he kind of changes it a little bit. So every brush stroke is, is a little bit different, which is very different than let's say the the Andy Warhol painting we made last week in which we really wanted as consistent and flat of a color as possible with with no modifications in it whatsoever. Monet, very different artist working a hundred years before um, or well I guess really painted this painting maybe only 50 years before you know which you know is in the span of, of art history, a blink of an eye. <laughs> it's kind of crazy to think, of, like, just 50 years after Monet paints a painting like this, we have Warhol, which seems like light years away. But uh, anyway, so now I'm just going to take my brush, and uh, maybe I'm going to bring this back here. And as I paint, I could just really quickly fill in everything, but what I'm going to do is sort of just hopscotch around and kind of maybe looking for maybe some of my lighter areas. Now, I'm not sure if that comes across on camera very well, but I'm painting over some of my lines. Now, you have to be careful. If you put a lot of white into your on your paintbrush, it can really hide your pencil lines. But, you know, I, as I said, I've got maybe 10, 20% of white in here. So it's still going to allow a little bit of that color to come through. So now I'm just painting all of these little water lilies. And, you know, technically this is kind of part of my foreground. But a lot of these water lilies are the same color as the white. Or as the, sorry, the lighter reflections in the water. So I'll paint these guys in. I might brighten some of them up. Now I'm going back into my paint for the first time. And sometimes I like just to get a little bit of paint on the outer edges. So I'll just do that real quick. I don't mind if a little bit of yellow shows through. I, I actually kind of like that. I've, I've said many times before that one of the things that I like doing when I'm at art museums is I, I'm the kind of guy who's looking at the painting from the side, and I always see the security guard thinking like, I wonder if, is that guy trying to find the security system or how to steal that painting? Um, uh, it's because I'm really curious to see how artists treat the sides of their paintings. So again, I'm just kind of jumping around, filling this painting up and you can see like I'm not too concerned about making this painting perfect um, at, at least at this stage I'm I am more just sort of plop and paint in as quickly as possible uh, I'm gonna add maybe a little bit more white here quickly make up another mixture it's a little bit more white and just sort of paint some of this in. And I'm kind of moving quickly too because the, the thing with with the acrylic paint is it dries quickly, right? So if I want to kind of have my paint mix at all, 
on the canvas, I need to be painting quickly or I want to add things into the paint that will help it um, to slow the drying time down. So if I, if I get paint on here and I just start kind of painting quickly, then the paint that's already there can kind of blend a little bit into the paint I'm using. And at times, like, I'm, the paint is going on kind of thin, and there's a lot of yellow coming through. Um, I'm going to take this sort of lighter color again. And I would normally not do what I'm doing here on any other painting, but in this type of painting, you know, you can see sometimes you got darker colors that that kind of creep up the paint. This metal piece called the ferrule, you know, I, I'm trying to kind of keep that um, uh, sometimes it just gets clogged up with paint, so but I don't mind if it if I rub it off because you know, some darker colors come off, and I kind of like that. Okay. You can see I, there's still lots of little gaps of yellow in there. I don't mind that either. So now I'm going to go back the other way. Now I'm going to take maybe a little bit of darker color, mix that into my mixture, and then kind of, hmm, let's see, is that too dark? That might be a little bit too dark. So you got to be kind of subtle, right? So I'm just going to go back. And just you can see how the right side of the painting starts getting, you know, there's it's uh, darker anyway. But we might use a, a slightly different color there, so. And I think a big part of the way Monet paints is the speed, right? So you see, I'm just sort of like darting all around. And it's, you know, easier said than done if you're a beginner artist to paint quickly, because you're just like, I don't know. It's like, that's, you know, it's like uh, watching a chef chop, you know, vegetables really, really quickly. Chop, 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 chop. Whereas like for me, it takes 20 minutes to cut up an onion, right? And you're like... Yeah, I don't think I'm quite that fast, but ideally, the way that Monet would paint would be really, really quickly, because there's there's a look that paint has when it's applied very quickly that is pretty hard to emulate if the brush is just sort of slowly going across the canvas. So... Again, there's, there's areas where they're a little bit patchy with a little bit of yellow coming through. And I, I just want to remind you that this is still the first stage of the painting. I'm just quickly getting the, the paint on here. And then I'm going to kind of, we're going to work a little bit more in the background. And then I'm going to start doing some foreground stuff. And then I'm going to come back to the background. I might even remix that color again, which means it might be slightly different, which in this case is great because it adds that little bit of variety. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not interested in creating this nice, smooth, like for instance, again, this was our Warhol painting we made last week. And we, we did, in, in terms of the way Warhol painted, he wouldn't want there to be different kind of shades of uh, a very similar kind of teal, although this one's got a little bit more yellow in here. He wanted that to be solid, consistent, right? So we, and when we did that, we mixed up a big batch to paint with. Here, we can kind of go for, use lots of small little batches of color, mix it up, and if we get the color wrong the next time, no problem, no problem at all. Okay. Heidi says, it looks like how we painted the A.Y. Jackson clouds. Yes, very perceptive. Yes, I like how you, you picked up on that. Yes. Kind of 
because A.Y. Jackson would have been very familiar with the Impressionist painters, because A.Y. Jackson um, studied briefly in in Europe, in Paris, and Germany. A.Y. Um, A.Y. Jackson is a Canadian painter who, who was really the 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 founding. He was a founding member of the Group of Seven, which is a very famous Canadian art group of the 1920s and 30s. Um, but he was also like the 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 main force behind the Group of Seven. Um, but he really was in, very inspired by the Impressionist artists that he saw when he was in Europe. Um, so, I'm just thinking what we should do next. Do I want to... Let's look at the original painting here and just sort of kind of inspect it for clues and, and ideas here. So what we've done so far is we've got this kind of teal color in the background and we could have spent more time on this. Remember, I'm trying to just paint the painting, you know, as quickly as possible for a beginner painter, right? That's why this painting is towards the top of the Dropbox folder. Um, so we could have, we could really spend a lot of time mixing very slight variations of this color. But I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to a warmer blue, which is this, blue, the warmer blue, which a warm blue tends to have almost a slightly purplish quality um, in opposition to the cool blue, which has a maybe slightly greenish quality. Um, so we can see that this is his ultramarine blue that's in the dark areas. I mean, we we could... Yeah, you know what? I, I, that's what I'm going to do. I might actually put a bit of... Well, let me see. What did I say in my instructions? Uh, the middle ground, warm yellow, warm blue. I'm probably going to go to step five here. So let's do that first. The warm yellow plus warm blue. Or no, what did I? Oh, I think I need to add another step in here for those darker colors. So, um, what I'm going to do, I'm actually now going to kind of switch down to a slightly smaller brush. Because now I'm starting to kind of get into... Yeah, you know what? I'm going to stay with a bigger brush. Let's stick to stay before I get too much into the details. So I'm going to take my um, warm blue here. I'm going to take a little bit of warm red. Or sorry, warm yellow. And that's going to give me this really dark uh, color really dark green. In fact, I'm just going to make it a little bit darker. Now, this is the kind of the color that I, we're going to use for doing some outlining. But before I jump into that, I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take a little bit of this cool blue and mix that in. Maybe a little bit of yellow in there too. So I got a bunch of different blues and yellows in here. And, and basically what that's doing is it's sort of dulling the color out a little bit, which is, is good because in opposition to the really bright color. And, and, you know, Monet is fascinated by light and color effects. And so he really likes these saturated colors. He also likes dull colors. And it's that contrast which is super effective. So... Let's uh, put this side by side. And so I'm just sort of painting kind of pretty loosely, almost like a little bit of a dry brush. And don't worry if you know if I'm if I overlap some of my. Um, uh, water lilies in here. That's okay because I can just paint them back later on, which is exactly the way that Monet would have painted himself. So 
so sorry this is it's not quite as um purple as i was planning earlier i'm gonna do that next this one's got a, still that it's got a bit more of a, a warm green quality and you can't go wrong here if you if you accidentally put a little bit too much of a dark color let's say i'm going to put that up there which is not really there that's okay because i can just paint use that as an opportunity to introduce a little bit more lighter colors over top of it okay um Yeah, I'm just going to wipe this brush off. I'm not even going to bother cleaning it. I'm just wiping the brush off. Because now what I'm going to do... Remember I was saying don't take a bet on the on the cool red. Because I'm going to use that cool red now to make a purple. So I'm taking my cool red and my warm blue. Let's mix these guys together. But I'm going to have mostly uh, warm blue. Because that's going to give me a bit more of a purplish quality. In fact, that might be too purpley. Yeah, so I'm just going to put more blue back in here. And I wonder, this might be a bit strong of a color to put directly in. So what I might do, and you could do this with a little bit of water, but... I would strongly encourage you to instead use a material like this, which is called um, matte medium. And matte medium is just clear paint that has no pigment in it. And it is matte, meaning when it dries, it'll dry non-reflective. There is gloss medium, which is again is clear, but has a shiny quality when it dries. I personally am all, I'm not a fan of, of like really glossy paint. So this is going to look like I've added white to my paint, but I, I haven't w added white. I've, in fact, diluted this color ever so slightly, meaning that it's going to be a little bit more transparent and not quite so heavy and dark as the original. So I'm just going to kind of brush this in in a few places. So what that does, maybe if I just zoom in, is it kind of just gives it this um, really neat, I'm not sure if it even comes across as well on camera, but these semi-transparent layers of paint to, that kind of starts building up that depth that we talked about briefly earlier, right? Where we have multiple colors seeming to kind of coexist on top of one another and combining to create new colors, kind of like a Venn diagram or something, right? Okay. So, I think that's good enough for this layer. Believe Jesus says uh, that looks that look right there is the same I get after the first layer. What to do next? <laughs> um, Deborah says uh, I can't paint right now. Interesting to watch with our fur babies around our legs. <laughs> um, Believe Jesus says, given this is acrylics, there are no oil style glazing, which is what would help with light effects of Monet. Suggestions on how to achieve the same in acrylics? Um, 
Well, I, yeah, I think I, maybe I just answered your question by adding a little bit of matte medium. It can help build up those semi-transparent layers. And, you know, that semi-transparent, building up those semi-transparent layers is um, how artists have painted uh, uh, water seascapes for hundreds of years, for sure, yeah. In a process that is more closely related to glazing or um, and I use uh, uh, glazing fluid around here somewhere. <laughs> okay, I'm not using it today, but eventually I will, and I'll have to find that too. But I do have glazing fluid around here somewhere. Anyway, we're not using it, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, but uh, yeah, actually, and the way that, we're, in fact, by using acrylics, we can paint this painting much faster than Monet would. Monet would do a layer of paint and have to wait maybe a few weeks for that to dry because oil paint can take so long to dry. Um, so I think, I think I'm ready to move on to another step here. Hmm. <clears throat> So now that I've got my background kind of roughly um, kind of uh, identified here, what I want to do is start kind of plotting out maybe more carefully where the water lilies are going to go and where the, the seaweed is going to be. Okay, so let's, uh, let's actually, maybe let's look at the original again. And just think about matching up these colors so the color that we have up here this is you know um a much this is a warm green we can see that there's this it, it's very similar to the green that i mixed here earlier without before i put in the the cool uh blue and cool yellow so let's do that first let's take in fact, I'm gonna just gonna show you side by side these colors so you can see as I mix them. So I'm gonna take some of my warm yellow. Let's take a bit more. And we'll take some of our cool, or sorry, warm blue. So we got warm yellow and warm blue. And then I'm using, I think I said 70% yellow to 30% uh, blue. Obviously the more, um, yellow I put in the lighter it's going to be and one thing I might just add a little bit of white in here just to help separate it a little bit from the background sometimes if you're painting you know, if you're painting a lighter color on a darker background it might not show up quite as well so I'm putting a little bit of this in and then I can always paint over top of it and in fact, you know, actually this is the right size. This is good. And now the, I should also show you how I'm holding this brush. So you can see the brush, I'm holding it about almost as far away from the, from the tip as possible, right? And that's gonna allow, make the brush a, a lot more loose. So as I paint these brush strokes, I'm also kind of going in kind of S shapes and and just allowing the, the brush to sort of just, you know, just delicately rub along the surface of the canvas. So, so in some areas, it's going to be way more transparent.
Now I could have used maybe a slightly smaller brush for this, but that would also just slow this whole process down and, um, and just take much longer to do. And as I said, I'm trying to gear these, this kind of new season to a bit more of my beginner painters because there's plenty of more, way more complex paintings where I spend a lot more time and sort of getting things quote unquote perfect, or at least attempting to. Okay, so that's a lot, and maybe maybe too much in certain places. That's okay. So now I'm just gonna mix that color again with without the white. So this is gonna make it a little bit more transparent and maybe a little bit darker, especially, you know, even if it's the same color because it's going on to that, it doesn't have the white in there to, that is going to um, make it kind of pop a little bit more from the background. It kind of just blends in just a bit more. And I don't think you can sort of overdo this. If you do, then we can just add more water back over top of it, mix that teal that we had earlier and put that back into it. I'm just going to take a bit more blue into this mixture. So I'm getting a darker green without any white. way you can also clean up any your mistakes so for instance like right here I this is one of the yellows that I had some white in now I paint right over top of it and it, with this darker color and it's almost like it it I still see that previous color really well because it's got that white in there and that white is gonna it makes paint um, much more opaque and resists being covered up just that little bit more okay looks good but I think I'm gonna go now with a lot more blue let's take some more blue and is that too much maybe that's too much let's just go take it down just a bit more So now I've just got all of these beautiful layers of paint that are mixing in, which is exactly, you know, what Monet loved is that effect of like where we see colors through other colors, layers upon layers, and it gives us that effect of like looking through water. Now, maybe I've gone too far. You know, maybe you might say, "Ooh, I don't know. Maybe there should be more, I've, I've overpainted too much of my background. I got now too much green. That's okay. I'm not at all concerned because I can always sort of add more of that color when I go back to the background shortly. But before I do that, I want to uh, start outlining my water lilies. So 
so I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to a small brush now. Or actually, maybe I'm gonna mix my paint first, and that paint actually is gonna be a bit more on my purple side. So I'm gonna take this color. Remember, I added some matte medium in there. I think I, I don't want it to be quite so clear this time. Kind of getting a bit purpley, but if this so right now that purple is is quite saturated, and I love saturated colors, but it might be too much because right now what I've done is I've taken my warm blue, my cool red, and so I've got a purple that's kind of right around here. I think I want a purple that's still just a little bit less intense. So what I'm going to do is I want to mix the opposite color. And that's going to pull that color into the middle. Now, I could make a combination maybe with some of my warm red and cool blue. In fact, maybe let's let's do that just for, for giggles here. I'm going to take my warm yellow. And let's just mix into this purple. Maybe I just, maybe was a little bit heavy-handed there. And you know what? Now that's gone kind of... Um, a bit gray, which doesn't surprise me that that would happen. So now I'm just going to dilute that by adding more. So now we've got like a very dark purple, like a really dark, uh, what would you call it, like eggplant color. I'm just going to put that to the side and just uh, let's mix up just so you can kind of see that we can kind of get the same color with two different colors. So if I take these two and mix them across the color wheel, my warm red and my cool blue, I arrive at a color that's similar here. All right? Maybe this one's still got a little bit more vibrancy to it. This one's definitely much closer to this neutral core. So this one, I think I'm, I'm gonna use this one anyway. Just because, again, it's 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 um, I, I I prefer the ultramarine blue, which is dominant in here, because that's also going to make that color come a little bit more forward. Versus the other color I just mixed has a cool blue, and we, if the cool color is if we have more cool pigment, that is going to make it want to recede a little bit backwards. I'm going to take this mixture and then now let's just kind of plot out where our um, water lilies are. And in fact, I'm going to go back just kind of looking at the original. And again, I'm not, I don't want to be perfect because otherwise these are going to be too rigid and, and carefully done. And part of the way that he's painting is it's a little bit kind of wobbly and so I could even maybe move my, my paintbrush up a little bit higher. And don't worry about getting the water lilies perfect or in the exact right place. Um, probably my own outline is not perfect either because it, it's pretty ambiguous as to how these water lilies look and so some of them are maybe more formed than others I'm just going to sort of tr roughly try to get them into the quote unquote right place but if they're not in the right place that's okay now this even here might be a bit too purpley but you know what I'm going to paint it like this and then I might decide to add, go back over it with a little bit of ultramarine blue. Um, but keep a bit of this more purpley color kind of showing through. You know, it's one of these things where... I mean... My brain is not big enough to, to know exactly what the painting is going to look like until it's very close to being done. So I don't obsess about 
getting everything perfect until I'm much closer to, to the very end of the painting. I allow for a little bit of uh, play to happen, which, after all, I want to have a little bit of fun while I'm painting, so... There's a big crowd watching. That's awesome. Um, there's another one in here. So notice, like, my my outlines are almost totally gone by this point, right? And so I'm uh, kind of making things up a little bit as I go here. Or looking at the original for some inspiration. I think it's possible that this is, might look quite different than the original after a certain point, which I don't mind. In fact, I like. It kind of makes me feel like uh, I'm not a slave to the original. Okay, now maybe just before I, I move on here, I still have this purple. I'm just going to take a little bit of this purple and just kind of add... A few of these sort of wavy lines into the background. And the brushes, you know, I allow it to get kind of some areas kind of clumpy and some that are a little bit thin and dry. And feel free to, if you if you get into doing this and you just want to put a whole bunch of these kind of little shapes in here, then you should do that exact thing. <laughs> That's pretty good for that step. Oops. And then you, you want to make sure you you uh, drop your paintbrush at least once, right in the middle of the painting, um, for for good luck, right? So I, yeah, I'm gonna go to. A little bit more of my my uh, warm blue and I'm just gonna put this into my color so it's it's like mostly warm blue I'm not gonna use a lot of this because it might be a little bit intense and kind of jump out and so if it is a little bit too intense I can always just add a little bit of yellow perhaps or even a little bit of warm red just to dull it down a little bit if you find it's a little bit much but I might just now go back over a few little areas here. Because I've got all this purple. And just like Monet, we want to have a little bit of variety. So not every line, but just little touches. So Monet would have painted this painting outside in his backyard at Giverny in the Japanese garden he had built. Um, and he was one of the first artists to go outside and make a painting. And, you know, in today's world, it seems like kind of like, well, what is so unusual about that? Like, uh, why is that a big breakthrough? Why, why would that be something special? Well, it's because for the vast majority of human history, um, artists had to mix their own paints. 
And this is this is actually really well shown in that movie, Girl with the Pearl Earring, starring Scarlett Johansson. It came out like a decade ago. Um, and in that movie, you see the artist Johan Ver the artist Vermeer, um, mixing his own paints, and and often she would be the one mixing. She's like his assistant would be mixing the paints for him. And it's a time consuming. You're you're literally like pistol and mortar grinding up different pigments. Mic you're like a chemist, adding a little bit of this, adding a little bit of that, stirring it together, and then you can use it for maybe a couple of hours to paint. And then you throw it out, or you just you try to use as much as possible. You really don't want to throw out your paint if you're mixing it yourself. Um, so you really couldn't go very far, unless you you had a big, you know, a, a caravan following you, you to, and somebody mixing paint for you. You're kind of stuck in your studio. Um, one of the great innovations that that transformed art during the Industrial Revolution is we started being able to buy pre-mixed paint in these little metal tubes. And artists could then just take a bunch of little tubes, put them in their backpack, go for a walk, find a really beautiful landscape, set up their easel, and just start painting, right? And that's, you know, we talked about A.Y. Jackson and the Group of Seven earlier. That's one of the, that's their big contribution to Canadian art history, even though there were a few artists before them doing landscape painting en plein air in the in the wide open outside in under the 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 the, the sky um the open sky um but en plein air means that painting outside in the in the landscape in the uh in the middle of the environment when it's might rain or it's cold and windy um, and that had been previously impossible or almost virtually impossible maybe some artists might open up their window and kind of maybe go outside and maybe come, run back inside and get a little bit, mix a bit more paint. But until the Impressionists and the Industrial Revolution, that was like virtually impossible. So as soon as that was available to artists, it, obviously people like Monet were like, well, I don't have to be trapped in my studio anymore. I can go make a painting anywhere. I don't, maybe I don't even need a studio. I could just, I, I make all my paintings outside. Anyway, long story short, let's go to our next phase. So we've we've done a pass on the background and done a pass on the foreground. What I want to do is go back to the background and just sort of maybe touch things up a little bit. And then we'll go back to the foreground and we're going to be getting pretty close to finishing this painting um, on schedule and on time. So Let's just think about what we might need to do to bring the backgrounds of these two paintings in alignment. So previously what I was doing is some, some very quick brush strokes. What I'm going to do is also some quick brush strokes, but I'm going to use maybe a smaller brush this time. And I'm going to remix this color. So I'm going to take my cool blue, put a little bit of yellow in there. Oop, that might have been a bit too much. It's very greenish. Uh, let's take some white. Let's start maybe with a little bit more white. And then let's go in here and maybe just quickly going back over some areas, kind of bringing the, the water lily shapes back into place. And again, my goal is not to get a color that's exactly like the color that was there before. It's to get, in fact, if anything, I kind of almost want people to see that I'm mixing a different color so that they see that there's like, I'm moving around and um, touching the same area a few times, creating a sort of web of color. And, you know, I just mixed in. I accidentally got a little bit of green in there. That's okay. I'm going to put a bit of that around. 
Let's see, I'm gonna come back into this area. Maybe paint that out a bit. Just get a bit different color. What is this color? It's a little bit more teal, that's okay. One thing I'm also doing is some brush strokes that are vertical and horizontal. Because the horizontal reflects more of the water and the flatness of the water. The vertical reflects kind of the what's kind of underneath or on top of the, the water. Kind of going into the water. Oh, and this one's got a little bit more teal in it, a little bit less white, that's okay. Remember, we want kind of lots of variety here. So to kind of help with that, sometimes just zooming around the painting, applying a little bit of paint here and there, getting a little bit of a different color on your brush, and then going, and then sort of just back and forth, back and forth, might help give you a bit more variety in preventing it from just sort of all becoming one color. Right, and I can kind of go back up into some of my weeds a little bit. With a little bit maybe more vertical lines. Maybe some darker, some lighter. You know, we could just, we could, I mean, I could, I love this kind of thing. I could spend all day um, doing this type of thing. Because I loved the buildup of just lots of nuance in these areas. How am I doing? Does it look a little bit... So one, one of the things that I, I will do when I'm painting... You know, if I've got the two side by side, is is squint my eyes, and I might look at my painting, and look at the original, and just sort of compare them, and that can like really help clarify what areas are darker and lighter. So, for instance, if I do that, I kind of squint my eyes, I start noticing, okay, this area has got a lot of green, and kind of lighter green. I think I'm gonna make that a bit. Mm, gonna bring this teal in. Hmm, might be a little bit much. Let's get a little bit of green. Hmm, maybe I overdid it. Let me just wipe a bit away. So, you know, 
also what we're, you know, when you're doing this kind of thing, like this is exactly what Monet is doing. In fact, this is probably the part of painting that Monet loved the most, where he is just, you know, massaging the canvas over and over, just taking a little bit of a different color, dabbing it around, um, and he would be painting that that landscape, that these water lilies in his backyard. And he would be looking at the original for inspiration. I'm just sort of making things up a little bit as I go here. I guess I need to kind of bring that back. All right, so I paint. I can paint things out. I can paint things back in. I love kind of. This is a kind of a little bit like how oil painting works. Is just sort of painting uh, something in and out, and kind of because with oil painting, because it takes so long to dry, you have uh, more of an opportunity to. Kind of just blend a color in if it's not um, exactly the way you want it or when you first apply that paint to the surface so there's this weird area in the middle of his painting that sort of gets kind of ambiguous right those lines kind of disappear so i want to try to capture a bit of that or the, the kind of the outlines for the um, water lilies become ambiguous and less defined. So I want to get that. How am I doing here? Looks like there's maybe more water. I kind of maybe got the the structure a little bit wrong up there, but I don't mind how that's turning out. I do think I might want to get a bit more white into my painting, especially at the top here. So I'm going to take a bit more of my cool blue. I need to get a bit more of it. And my brushes, this is pretty dry. Like... You know, I hear people all the time, they go, oh, my paints are always so dry. Like, how do you keep the paint wet? Like, we could add, I could use more paint that's fresher. But when the paint is kind of dry like this, then I can do this kind of dry brush painting, which he used all the time. And therefore, it's like, I don't know what the equivalent is in any other aspect of life. Um... It's sort of like if you're on a diet and you're buttering toast and you're, you're just kind of putting a little bit of butter on your knife and just kind of scratching the surface, a little bit of butter getting on there. It's kind of like what dry brushing is. You're not trying to slather it on. You're just kind of getting little the, the tips, the, the peaks of the toast, or in this case, the canvas. Um... So often when there's a lot of white in a color, it will recede. It wants to kind of go backwards into space, uh, as well as cooler colors want to recede. So up top there, you probably want to have more white than anywhere else. And if you kind of go a little bit too much, you can always try to rub it out with your finger. We're just going to bring it back or with a rag. Or paint over it, of course. Okay. Do I want to do... Anything down here? 
Hmm. So this, I mean, there's barely, the uh, paint is very dry. Just kind of kept getting a little bit of that yellow that was in my imprimatura, getting, uh, hiding a bit of that, but I like when it comes through personally. So I'm not worried about covering it up completely. It just felt like it might have been a bit too much down there. Okay. I think I'm content with my background. So I'm going to go to my foreground again. Okay, so now I'm ready to move on to my foreground. So, and really for the last time, I'm pretty happy with the background. Obviously, I could spend a lot more time getting really into the details, but I think now we're, we're, we're really getting close to um, finishing the painting. And I should say, like, you know, the fact that you can achieve something as quickly as this using this impressionist technique is one of the the things that impressionists loved because you know Monet's painting outside and um, he wants to be able to paint very quickly because the light is changing quickly right you know if you're trying to paint water lilies and the sun is moving through the sky and clouds are moving you it's it's very hard to make to spend eight hours on a painting like that because over the course of eight hours, that light is is changed five times, and so you're you're painting like ah, well everything looks different now. I got to mix different colors, so he's got to paint very fast. There's this urgency to the way that he's painting. It's also one of the reasons why the impressionists are are ridiculed and criticized so harshly by artists of the time, is because they're just like, are you kidding me? You're gonna pass this off as art? Seriously, this looks like my kid could do that, or what they might say, this looks like you're underpainting. This looks like the beginning of a painting, not the end of a painting. You're telling me you're maybe 20 minutes from finishing? Like, pff, the way that an academic painter would paint, this might be, you know, 5% done, and there's going to be another six weeks of painting on this painting. So you could imagine those artists who are who take like months to finish one painting or like you're telling me you're doing two or three paintings a day and then you're selling them for nearly as much or maybe more than the painting I spent six months on like hmm that that just is not that doesn't sound right but part of them are like hmm maybe I should think and adopt that strategy a little bit more I could maybe make a little bit more money anyway Let's, uh, what do I want to show here? Let's go to side by side and just think about what I might want to do next. I mean, I'm feeling pretty confident. I might want, I could kind of clean up some of my, my brush strokes in here, but I don't know. I don't know if I feel too compelled. Um, well, you know what? I'm, I am looking down at the bottom down here. I do almost see a little bit of orange. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my warm yellow and a little bit of red, warm red, mix that in. I'm also just going to take a tiny bit of blue. that blue is going to make it go just a bit more brown and if it's too orange it might be just too intense so where can I in fact let's go to a smaller brush So you'll find that, you know, painting, let's say this color I'm right now, if I start painting it into some of the darker areas, it's going to barely show up. 
Whereas if I paint it on my lighter areas, it really pops. That isn't if I if I really want this color to show up in my darker areas, I might have to add a little bit of white, let it dry, and then paint back over top of it with the same color minus the white. Or maybe you don't need to paint over it a second time, but um, because as this paint dries, it's probably going to darken down and become a little bit less visible. So it might go on, and probably on camera, it might be a little bit brighter. But as we go, it'll probably kind of disappear a bit into that darker background, which I don't mind. I mean, at least the way that, that, I, that what I need here, I don't mind, but... Uh, I am going to take a bit of white. Because there looked like a little bit of a peachiness in the bottom uh, left corner, or sorry, bo bottom center here. A little bit of peachiness. We're still going to get to these flowers here. I haven't forgotten about them. But um, just a little bit of this down here. Now, also, you know what? I'm going to put a bit of my glazing fluid in here. Now, again, you don't have to use glazing fluid. Uh, you could do this as a bit of a dry brush technique. You could try adding a bit of water. Um, but I always sort of discourage putting water into acrylic paint, except at the very beginning of a painting, because um, it's can make the paint actually look have a bit of a grainy quality as uh, um because then it's sort of the it's breaking down the the bonds of the paint so i'm just down here i might have add this might be a bit too much matte medium in terms of, so i'm just going to add mix a bit more of my paint. So here's my glazing or my matte medium. Maybe just put a bit more paint into it. So, you know, I could just, I'm kind of fiddling here, just, um, but this is the kind of stuff that I love, <laughs> I love doing, as you probably know. Um, so maybe I'm just going to try to wrap up this little bit, just a few little bit more details. The slightly peachier color at the bottom. I also like adding a little bit of that same color whenever I'm making a painting, just adding a bit of it elsewhere in the painting so it doesn't just seem like it's there's just one little area with that one color. Even if it's just a little dot here and there. You know, it's it's sort of, you know, like if you're when you're getting dressed and you're going out you know, if your your whole outfit is blue, but then you put on red shoes or something, it's like, whoa, okay, that's that's a little bit uh, of a loud contrast. So you know, some people will then maybe 
you got red shoes on, but everything else is blue. Maybe you have a little bit of a red pin. And then it's like, oh, there's red on the bottom, on, on the feet, and up near the face, right? So it's just making it seem like everything is kind of a little bit more cohesive. Let's look at these side by side. Maybe I'm doing too much of that. So I'm squinting my eyes, looking at it, thinking maybe I need to get a little bit darker. So maybe I'm going to take a bit of my this color. I'm not even going to bother cleaning my brush. I'll just take some blue, warm blue. So now I'm just sort of mixing a bunch of these random colors together, which again is very Monet, right? Just the the colors, cl you know, clashing and bouncing. As long as they're all coming from the same set of colors, it's all going to kind of fit quite nicely together. Okay, I think that's probably good. So now, <laughs> I love the lollies encouraging people to like and subscribe. Thanks, Lolly. Oh, you know what? Before I move on, let's just take another green. I'm going to lay the groundwork for these. Uh, the flowers here. So just taking that bit of green. Where is this one going to go? Let's put this in here. These are sort of like the little the leaves for my flowers. So I'm just going to put those there. Let's get a bit of blue into that green. darker while I've got this darker color maybe I can add that anywhere else that might need a bit more of a punch looks like that area needs to be darker doesn't it Another thing I think about like with this type of painting is it, it kind of makes my eyes a little bit crossed because it's sort of like I'm not even really looking so much at detail. I'm looking at the overall painting and just sort of moving and moving and moving all over as much as possible. So adding just some much smaller brush strokes also helps give it a bit of a scale. Sometimes, you know, if everything is just really the same, you really don't, ideally, I don't think you want to use the same brush for every 
brush stroke on this on painting. Okay. There was a vertical line there that I didn't like, so I'm just going back in with my purple a bit. And... Made that a bit more horizontal, so it didn't feel like there was a lily pad that was going straight up in the air. So, last but not least, let's get our flowers in here. And I'm going to start out with some white. And I don't, you see, I didn't even clean my brush. Because I don't, again, like Monet, I don't really mind having colors that are slightly off. Even though I'm going to use this white, it's sometimes kind of nice just having a color where people are like, how did you get that color? And sometimes you don't even know. You're just like, I was just, whatever was left on my palette. So, how about let's... using a little bit of both cool red so I'm gonna start with a bit of cool red in my white and I'm not gonna mix this all in I'm just gonna get a little bit of both on my brush so that when I paint I'm gonna have kind of a bit of a nuanced color that's got kind of multiple colors in it leave that like that not it's not per not done nor is it perfect in fact maybe I could even take a little bit of blue and make that slight ever so slightly purpley oops sorry where am i so i took some of my warm blue and my cool red and just mixed that in here Still a little bit dark. What I could use is my. I'm just gonna squeeze a tiny bit of cool blue into my mixture to get it a little bit darker. Kind of like this mixture. much wet paint there so we'll have to wait for that to dry a bit uh, let's 
that's good. Okay, and then the other thing, so you could start now seeing he's got a very, like, very, very dry brush with this, almost the same color. You could use, like, glazing fluid just to dilute it down a little bit. So maybe I'll just do quickly with that. So I just put a little bit of, of my glazing fluid here, mixing this into this color. Just, you don't want to overdo it, but just these, again, just like I was saying, you know, you can, it's nice to have a bit of, uh, if you put a color somewhere, giving it like a little echo elsewhere in the painting. So maybe I'll just zoom back. I don't want to overdo it. I might be doing a bit much. Uh, I'm going to get a bit more white on my brush here. to my darker color. Do I have any of this darker purpley color here? So I should say, really, at this point, I'm looking very little at the original. I kind of glance at it just for a bit of inspiration, but then I move on pretty quickly. Like, you know, for instance, like I might look at, at them here and just think like, hmm, maybe do I need to just want to do a little bit of adding a little bit of white um, highlights here. So I'm going to take my cool blue, a little bit of cool yellow, and just see if there's a few little areas. Is that too white? Let's just add just a little, make it slightly darker. So, um, I'm just going to, oops. So 
So I just want to do my finishing touches now. I'm just going to add little bits of highlights onto the water lilies, maybe the little orange dot here, just very few minor little details and then we'll be done very soon. Um, so. I want to be careful about making these too light because I don't want them to compete with the flowers. So I don't want too much white in there. As I go Further up here, though, I, it's okay to get a little bit more lighter and lighter. at the little orange dot so I'm going to take my warm red and warm yellow mix those together close to being done I want to do my um, do the Monet's signature here So to do the signature, what I'm going to do is use a Posca pen. I've mentioned these before. Posca pen is uh, a pen that paints or that draws with acrylic paint. So these are really great for tiny details. The, the one thing with Posca pens is um, it seems like if you get, if it could be months after it's dried. If you get a little bit of water on it, it will smudge and run, which I think is is you know, like a major deficit of this material, but it is what it is. So you just have to be careful that you don't, uh, you know, whereas the rest of an acrylic painting, once it's dry, it's usually, um, you know, pretty resistant, like to, to water or, uh, but you really don't want to be wiping it with a wet cloth or anything, but the Posca pen does smudge, so just a kind of bit of a heads up. Let's go to I enlarged his signature so that I could see it nice and easily when I'm doing this type of exercise here. Uh, 
Okay, um, before I paint, I'm just going to make sure that the Posca pen works. Obviously, also, as the pen gets used more and more, uh, the, the point starts to kind of get dull. Actually, I probably shouldn't have used a black for this, but it just occurred to me right now. Probably would have looked nice with a, uh, a red or a dark blue. That definitely looks like a forged <laughs> signature. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um... Just, there's that little little dot of paint that just dry it to keep thinking it's a smudge or something. So I'm just gonna paint it out. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know what else I can do. So John says, looks great. Gotta go. Have a great evening, guys. Kathy says, my leaves look like stones. I've uh, gotta go. Hubby has dinner ready. See you next week, and thanks. Believe Jesus says, looking great. Thumbs up, Tanya. Hey, all. This looks amazing as usual. <laughs> um, cool. So, let's, uh, let's wrap up here with our side-by-side -side comparisons and just see how these two paintings look and just sort of evaluate maybe what we could do if we had a bit more time. So before we do that, I encourage you to uh, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell here on YouTube so you know when upcoming videos are happening so you don't miss any of those uh, upcoming episodes. Sometimes I do them spontaneously and when you um, take a photograph of your work and upload it to the Facebook group, right that way you get some feedback from myself but also from the very active audience that is uh, participating in these classes look we're almost at 500 people that's amazing so do that asap join and if you want to support the channel if you want to help me get better audio um like the people who donated so i could get better microphones uh, again i buy all the materials everything so nothing sponsored so these are things that i know that work um, consider making a small donation as little as a dollar through the PayPal. There's a link in the description below. So, these two paintings side by side, how did we do here? We painted, what, we spent about an hour and a half on this painting. And I feel pretty good about that. You know, I mean, I look at it, I see like, oh, I guess this vine or seaweed or whatever it is could be a bit bigger. You know, these uh, uh, water lilies could have moved over. I mean, little tiny compositional details that are a little bit off. You know, maybe there was a little, I did a little bit too much leaves under there. Um, I think maybe some of my initial uh, uh, green warm green that I put in here. Remember I added a little bit of white? Maybe I didn't need to do that after all. It, it might have might be just a bit too intense. I could have been a bit more subtle. Um, and maybe I didn't even need to put this down here in the bottom. I don't mind it though as it is. 
So I'm, I'm more than happy walking away from a painting like this. It's not exactly the same, but I think, um, I think it looks pretty good. Let's just sort of just zoom in a bit here and just compare. Maybe we'll start top left corner here. Yeah, I mean, I feel like in terms of my brush strokes in this area, I'm pretty close. You can see there's a lot of, of, of this dry brush with, that he's using here. So maybe I could have done more dry brush with this painting. I go down. Obviously, I made the signature much bigger <laughs> because it would have been just prohibitively small for me to do at this scale. Um... You can also see, obviously, this the painting, the original painting, is two meters wide and just under two meters tall. This is nine by twelve inches, which is you know maybe twenty times smaller. So you know even like little these the way that I painted this, you know it's the 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 water lilies have a much wider shape. They don't have quite the nuance that his do. But again, his are much, much, much bigger. So don't worry about making it perfect. Because if, especially if you're painting at this scale, I hate to break it to you, but it's, in, unless you're painting with like a tiny, tiny brush, it's got one hair on it, you're gonna have a hard time getting all those little nuance. Um, yeah, I mean, I. That is definitely not there, These that really dark leaves in there. I, I don't know if I feel like I want to change it, though. Um, let's go to the far right here. Um, I mean, as I'm looking at this, like the striking thing to me is just like how quickly this painting has been painted. It doesn't mean that he did it all very like in one like hour long period. It's just that the brush strokes are applied very quickly, and obviously because he's painting with oil paint, it takes a long time for that paint to dry. So often he might be painting very quickly, but it might take him months to finish a painting like this. Yeah, I mean obviously he didn't quite get all of the exact detail in there but pretty good i like how in his it's just kind of weirdly messy up top there so that's why i was trying to get a bit of that just kind of wild painting in there you can even see here how he's definitely gone back with that teal that we put and then he's that we used to start the painting and he's gone back and painted over some of that green that he had applied underneath the weeds and just sort of hid part of it right so he, he it has a great look of sort of showing, it's almost like those, they're disappearing underneath the water, behind or underneath those water lilies. Okay, so I think we will end it there. Thank you everyone for painting along with me and I cannot wait to see the painting that you create please join the Facebook group, post it there so that we can all celebrate your work. Uh, I think next weekend we'll be doing our feedback episode. And then next, this time next week, next Thursday, we're going to be painting uh, uh, some flowers by Berta Morisot. We did some flowers by Berta Morisot two years ago. We're doing a different set of flowers next week. Um, and uh, yeah, lots of other stuff coming down the pipeline as we go forward. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we shall see you all again very soon. Wherever you are on our beautiful planet, take a moment to be grateful that you're alive and healthy and safe. And we'll see you again. Take care, everybody. Good night.